Hey everybody. Hey, how's it going? Um, I was going to wait until after all three episodes aired, but I figured I would just go on and give you my thoughts on parts one and two of The Beatles' Get Back, directed by Peter Jackson. A couple thoughts, uh, actually not a couple thoughts, I got a lot of thoughts. This is probably going to be long, I'm not going to do any editing on this. Uh, and cut anything out, so. But, kind of talk about it from a film perspective, if I can. I don't know if I can, because I'm so into the Beatles. I mean, first off, episodes one and two, parts one and two. I have no complaints. Spoiler alert. No complaints. I know a few critics out there, uh, like the one in The Guardian we're talking about, uh, oh, this is just a bunch of aimless footage with no direction. I don't know if they were um, reviewing you know, Let It Be or The Beatles Get Back. I don't know. If you want to talk about aimless footage with no point, let's talk about Let It Be. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Peter Jackson's film. It is long. It is long. But... If any, uh, any of you guys who've been following me and sticking with me, when they first announced this, I think back in 2019, when they first made what was going on public, I said, I don't want an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minute uh, Ron Howard, the Beatles, eight days a week, the touring years kind of Thing. I bring that up because Ron Howard is a famous filmmaker like Peter Jackson is. I mean, Peter Jackson, he starts out with slasher comedies, with uh, Bad Taste, which I totally, totally, totally love, and then Dead Alive and Meet the Feebles, and then finally he goes with, uh, he, he breaks on through to the mainstream with Heavenly Creatures and then The Frighteners, and then he shocks everybody with the Lord of the Rings trilogy perfect. You could take it as a whole work, and you could take them as three separate films, three separate epics. That's what I compare The Beatles Get Back to, because essentially, it's a trilogy. You take it as a whole, but these are three epic documentaries that you can watch as separate things. You know, you have part one, The Legend of Twickenham. Part two, the two Beatles. <laughs> you know, like the two towers, because you have the Beatles at Twickenham and the Beatles at Apple. Um, and part three, Return of the Fab. <laughs> so, but seriously, the first one is two and a half hours long. Uh, this uh, part two is just under three hours, two hours and 57 minutes, I believe. So that's an epic in its own right. Not just for length, but you got to talk about scope of this thing. Even though it's 14 days in the Beatles' life, almost a month, um, a lot happened in that month. So I said, originally, I want two and a half hours to three hours minimum. Here, we're getting close to eight and I think we need to take our time with this because this is a period of the Beatles that has been editorialized to death by so-called Beatle scholars who have written books from Philip Norman to Nicholas Schaffner to Albert Goldman to all these people who were never around the Beatles to even the Beatles themselves. Because all of their memories are in hindsight when they talk about Let It Be, the final film. And I think a lot of their hindsight has sort of tainted our thoughts over the years. But some of us who would actually go and listen to the Nagra tapes and read transcripts of the Nagra tapes started to see a different story emerge. Something that was somewhere in between. So... Let's talk about part one. Uh, part one of Peter Jackson's three-part epic, which is an epic film in its own right. Let's call this, like I said, uh, The Legend of Twickenham. 
even though it's days one through se uh, days one through ten, I believe, uh, or days one through seven, I, I forgot what days it is. But I'm going to give it a much more epic title, the le uh, uh, a much more L Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings title, The Legend of Twickenham. That's what I'm going to call it, because I think it's appropriate. And um, a lot of people were talking about, oh, w w why did he do that 11-minute uh, montage at the beginning? I think, one, it was to put the history of the Beatles in there, but two, also put everything into perspective. This is where they were. And this is all of the crap that went down for them to now get to this point. And, I mean, Twickenham is not as bad as everybody had made it out to be. But it's also not Days of Wine and Roses either. Twickenham was a miserable place. I mean, this big soundstage they were on, which is the soundstage that you build some of the big sets on. You know, a lot of the interiors of Help were shot at Twickenham. So you can, you can imagine that was the stage that had the Beatles' house on it, you know? And some of the reasons for Twickenham was be, was because Dennis O'Dell, you find this out in, in, in the, in the, the you know, subtitles, in the narration with the titles, that makes sense, sorry. Uh, that, you know, Dennis O'Dell had a deal at Twickenham to get the Beatles in there, and, and Ringo was going to start shooting the Magic Christian. So they were under the gun to, to write and record a new album and come up with a live show. And I think doing it at Twickenham was a way of possibly saving time. Once we're done here, Ringo could go straight into production. And I don't... Uh, straight into production on the Magic Christian, which is on the other stage. So, right off the bat, it seems like the emotions are good between George, Ringo, and Paul. John was going through his heroin phase. Rather heartbreaking as far as that, but he was going through his heroin phase. So he was showing up rather late. I think he may have been on time the first day. Yeah, in fact, the first day it's John, George, and Ringo, who I believe are there first, and then Paul shows up. But John starts coming later and later and later and later. And you could kind of see the frustration there. But, I mean, John is contributing to other people's songs. He's, he's coming out with ideas. Um, he's coming out with ideas. It seems like they're really trying to collaborate. But John's got no songs. Paul has songs. George has songs. George is playing All Things Must Pass. Um, Gimme Some Truth. John brings Gimme Some Truth in what was on Imagine. And it looked like it was originally a co-written effort between uh, John and Paul. Uh... Does that song need to be now credited as Lennon McCartney? Hmm, I wonder. But, I mean, um, a lot of breakdowns, but there's really no arguments. But Paul is really in charge here. John is like second in command. Paul is driving the ship here. He's got the enthusiasm. And Michael Lindsay Hogg, who is now a character in this piece, in the first one, he's the, um, he's the, just the director. He occasionally makes some appearances, but here he's now the, you can see him directing, and he's kind, trying to direct the documentary. He's constantly getting them to talk about the show, and John is fairly enthusiastic about the show. Uh, but the ideas just start getting ridiculous. Paul wants them to do something totally illegal. John seems like he's willing to go along with anything, you know. He says at one point, this is all communication. That's why I'm doing it for me. Um, Michael Lindsay Hogg wants to do it in this Roman amphitheater that's in Libya and have 10,000 uh, Arabs show up at, at, at dusk and the Beatles are there. And it's like... It's, and eventually, they just, these ideas just start getting, in my opinion, too far out. 
So it does take George to kind of say, what the hell, you know? And eventually they're coming up with all these wacky ideas. But Ringo is adamant, I don't want to go abroad. He says that at first. Um, Michael Lindsay Hogg at one point talks to him um, about, well, why don't you, you know, think it over? And if you change your mind... And he keeps interrupting everything. We need to talk about uh, where we're going to do the show. And it's like, these guys don't ha hardly have any songs. John only has Don't Let Me Down, and he resurrects Across the Universe. Um, at one point, they are talking about Child of Nature, or On the Road to Rishikesh, as it was called. Um, but um, there's an interesting discussion that happens where Paul talks about we need the sort of adult figure in our lives now. We've pretty much haven't had that since Mr. Epstein had passed. And during that whole sequence, uh, Peter Jackson keeps cutting back to John, who keeps on looking up and looking at the camera. Um, I kind of think... It implies, at least in my eyes, that John was kind of lost after Brian Epstein passed. And I've often said that, that the only person who could have controlled any of this situation was Brian Epstein. He could have gotten everything under control and uh, made sure the Yoko situation was okay. So, interesting there. And it's, a, it's not really a heated discussion, but Paul is trying to sort of rally the troops... Paul is very tolerant to Yoko, and I'm going to get back to this, but Yoko's not intrusive as everybody had made her out to be to begin with. She's there next to John, but she's occupying herself. She's not giving her opinions. She's not giving her opinions. She's just there occupying herself. Uh, she's sitting next to and sometimes she walks away from John, and it's just John and the four guys. Sometimes she comes back. Other times um, she's doing artwork. So she's got her stuff that she's trying to work on. So, I find that interesting. But uh, you can sense George's frustration. Now, now briefly, the, the, the famous argument in Let It Be. You know, I don't mind. I'll play whatever you want me to play. Or I won't play at all if you don't want me to play. You know, is put into proper perspective now. There's more before and more after. It's a little disagreement. But Paul's trying to be standoffish. I don't want to seem like I'm bossy. So after they, ha I mean, George is just trying to say, you know, but you know, look, we have to come up with, I'll play whatever you want me to play, but whatever it is that'll please you, I'll do it. But there's a but he eventually gives after a space, which is cut out of, of, of Let It Be. And then Paul is just like he goes. I mean, Paul's like, no, no, no. But you're you, you're doing it again, is, and George is, you know, trying to compromise, and Paul then wants to move on, you know, and he says, let's do another number, and George goes, no, 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 let's get this down. We we're gonna have to learn it anyways. So George is really trying to be team player, but towards the end of the Twickenham sessions. John perks up, in my eyes. He starts to perk up. He's learning the bass part on Let It Be. Uh, the exchange between John and Paul during she came in through the bathroom window. And so I quit the police department, get a job, cop, and got myself a steady job. It's about time. It's John and Paul are start. John is starting to loosen up. Yes, he's still showing up late from whatever he's doing with heroin. Um, but he's starting to slowly come alive. And on the last day George is there, uh, the, the day George walks out, uh, this is something I, I noticed and I picked up on. And that's why everybody is talking about the pacing of part one. It's very slow. I argue that it's deliberately paced. It's deliberately paced. First off, you you are with the Beatles, and you are getting the monotony of Twickenham. You really are. And then it starts to pick up that tension. Then the day George walks out, John gets up, 
Paul and him are sharing a mic, and they finally are the teenagers again. They're they're joking, they're cracking jokes, they're jumping up and down. They're they're cr crazy. And Peter Jackson keeps cutting back to George, playing the same song, and he's just like looking around, and you could just see it right there. George is the odd man out. He's always been the odd man out. John and Paul, even with Yoko there, have this connection. And despite whatever problems John is going through with drugs, they still have this connection. They still have a love. And you could honestly say, well, George is like, well, fuck it. Why the hell am I here? So I could understand why he says, I'm leaving the group. See you around the clubs. I mean, um, but even getting back to one thing in, in, in part one, I always thought the waltz with John and Yoko during I Me Mine was John trying to take the piss out of George and not wanting to participate. But John is waltzing with Yoko during uh, I Me Mine, and then he walks over and says, all right, I better get in there. And he says something to the effect of, I better get in there and learn this. And George looks at him and says, do you want to do that on the show? I think that would be great. <laughs> and then John is slightly embarrassed and he does some little dance move. So I thought that was great. Even that, I think, was blown out of proportion in uh, uh, the Let It Be film and um, in, in, in history. But there's an interesting moment after George walks out, which they really didn't take seriously at first. And Michael Lindsay Hogg is still talking about doing a bloody show, even after George walks out. And John talks about, well, if he doesn't come back, we'll get you know, Clapton. And John said, I still want to be a Beatle. Um, but there's a nice moment towards the end of part one where John, Paul, and Ringo get in kind of a huddle, and they sort of give each other a hug, you know? So you can tell Twickenham, they're, they're coming apart, but it's kind of a tug of war. They're coming apart, but they're fighting to keep it together. Something I never saw before. They are fighting to keep it together. Damn it. We're going to keep this thing going. And if it doesn't go, we're going to, and if the whole thing sinks to the bottom of the ocean, well, we're going to sink with it. You know, that's kind of the attitude I took. And it ends on a down note. Uh, they meet with George and it, it doesn't go well. So that was very emotional. Very emotional. I thought part one was very emotional. But I could see a lot of things that I never saw. This wasn't the whitewash that everybody was saying it was going to be. Yes, there's joyous moments in Twickenham. But you could see them coming apart. But you can also see them trying to put some sort of crazy glue on those cracks. And it's just not quite sticking yet. Uh, if that makes sense. Part two begins where part one actually left off. Part two. The two Beatles. Twickenham and Apple. <laughs> but it begins with the famous discussion that Paul has... With Ringo and Michael Lindsay Hogg and Neil Espinall and um, 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 and Linda and uh, and Ringo, I, I think I said Ringo. I don't know, <laughs> but anyways, um, and it's an interesting conversation because Paul is being diplomatic about you know Yoko. Nobody can get in touch with John. They've been ringing John all morning and like the phone is off the hook, um, and um, um. They're trying to get John. And Paul is, you know, the whole famous thing. Um, 50 years from now, people are going to be saying the Beatles broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. And fair enough. That is what happened. Not from all of us, but there's still a lot of people out there who, who blame Yoko. Um, like I said, and I'll say it again, um, even if Yoko wasn't there, it would have been something else. Um, it was bound to end after Brian Epstein passed. Epstein could have handled all this. But Paul talks about that. He says, you know, sh uh, you know, they want to be together. The young l lovers are in love, you know, and, uh, you know, I, and I have to respect that. And, uh, you know, and I don't want to irritate John, but Yoko knows that. And, and Neil, but he's going overboard and Paul goes to Neil, but that John always goes overboard. That's John. They finally get John on the phone. 
and Paul takes the call. When Paul steps away, now Linda, so there's two sides to here. Um, everybody complains about Yoko, oh, the, the, the feminist, she's got to give her opinion. Well, here Linda finally gives her opinions when Paul steps away. They need to play live. Me as a fan, I want to see this. And Paul comes back and he says something to the effect of, uh, stop it, Yoko. <laughs> you know, so, and Linda kind of pipes down again, you know. But uh, he says, John's coming, uh, John's coming, and I'm sure John was probably embarrassed. But the famous scene, uh, the famous conversation, I mean, uh, John and Paul go to the cafeteria, or, you know, canteen, as they say. And um, they have this conversation, and, they, and Michael Lindsay Hogg didn't tell them that he put a, a hidden microphone in the flower pot that was on the table where they were going to sit. So he captures this conversation, and it's with subtitles too. Uh, no footage, but this is where John is basically laying it out on the line, and he, he and he tells Paul, "Look, this has been a festering wound with George, and we never put um, band aids on it. And even after what happened yesterday, we still haven't put band aids on it. In other words, we needed to take care of this a long time ago." Um, and, and when and you're always telling everybody what to play in the arrangements, but even when I bring a song, I'm not so, I'm not telling you um, what to play uh, all the time. And it, he he um, he, uh, he he's basically telling uh, telling him, look, you know, um, you know, I, George is the odd man out here, and uh, you know, and 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 the both of us have egos here, you know. And Paul is sort of understanding this and seeing his side of it. Um, and um, it's an interesting conversation. I wouldn't call it an argument, but it is a conversation. And Paul even says something to the effect of John that, you know, you are the leader, you are the boss, and I was always, and I'm all, and, and, and I am second in command. Like Paul's kind of knowing his role. So the fact that Paul, even at that stage, is considering John the leader, I found interesting in that conversation. Um, and then the next day comes, uh, John, well, actually they do rehearse some and John agrees and John apologizes for being very late. And this is the first and only time it's addressed, probably because this is the first and only time it's addressed on the tapes. I'm sorry that I was late, but I was, but I got very stoned and high last night watching movies. The next day comes, they do absolutely absolutely nothing from what I, I gather. Peter Sellers came in and has a conversation. It's very awkward. Uh, it's you know, very awkward. And uh, getting back to the John and Yoko conversation, there's this nice close-up, un unbroken shot that Peter Jackson holds on of Paul sitting there, like tears in, about in his eyes. And that's the first time in the entire history of the Get Back Let It Be project that I felt sorry for Paul. I really felt sorry for Paul. And uh, I'm getting shivers right now th thinking about that shot. And even the next day when they're all, you know, three of them are sitting around and talking about, uh, you know, Paul's like, we have to get a system going. You know, we have to get something going here and just I, I I you know I it, it was a struggle for him you know he had to give some enthusiasm but they they meet with George again and it was much more positive they agree to stop talking about a television special they agree to record it as an album and they agree to get out of you know, Twickenham film studios and go to Apple which they thought Magic Alex was going to make them this wondrous studio. They have a bit of the session that, if there was a session, of what from Alex Alex's uh, you know desk, and it was nothing but and some talking in the back. Oh my God! Uh, another, but once they get there, after the first day of just uh, that, that they didn't film. Once you see, before Billy Preston gets in, 
Not, I know everybody said it was a different vibe improvement. John livens up. The whole vibe livens up. These guys are feeling good. These guys are feeling... It's the Beatles again. It's the fucking Beatles. It's them. It is them. They're coming alive. They're coming up with ideas. And John... John sort of, he comes out of that shell and he kind of takes over at Apple. This is John the leader again. He's coming up with ideas. He's suggesting things. You see this great collaboration and then Billy Preston gets in. We've always been told that George told Billy Preston to come to the studios because things were bad. No, Billy was in town playing with Ray Charles. They talk about it at Twickenham. Billy Preston gets there and then they say, hey, we were talking about we need some piano on some songs. So he, he sits in just for a laugh. He is the fifth member of the Beatles. If there was ever a fifth member of the Beatles, it's Billy Preston, especially during this time. And you could see he's a member of the band. John even says, you're giving us a lift, Bill. And, uh, and it's just amazing this they're going into the control room and uh all of these shots that they used to that they shared of the Beatles over the mixing desk like this no that's not it they're listening intently when you watch this they're just like that was great and hearing John talk to Ringo about the drum part on dig a pony uh, try and do like da boom boom da if you could get that feel going it's like what the hell happened, guys? What was going on at Twickenham? And I totally agree. That was a shit environment. But here, it's like, this is where the laughs come from. This is where the excitement comes from now. Um, and John is coming up with ideas. John is suggesting arrangements. John's coming up with lyrics to get back. They're all contributing to stuff. John even counts off get back and says, no, no, no. You build up, guys. Build up. And John is the one now who is not sort of calling the shots, but Paul seems almost happy that I can take a back seat here. We're all working well together. And they keep commenting on, you know, you guys are working um, well together. Why stop now? Um, and just I, I, two hours and 57 minutes for part two. I could have had that go on for five hours. Just that one episode. Um and now it's Paul who sort of, sort of takes a step back and is like, I don't know if we want to, if we want to, I don't know about a show. And John is like, well, you know, he he still wants a climax, and uh, there's no you know, climax. It's just a film of us being an album. Now we've always been told Alan Klein said we can make more money out of it being a feature film. No. Klein, they have John has his meeting with Alan you know, Klein, and they talk about it briefly. But they were talking about it now. We're now making a feature film. And Paul was like, no, if I wasn't noting that, we should have shot it in 35 millimeter because it's better quality. And George is like, no, it could be blown up. And Paul's like, 35 millimeter, uh, 60 millimeter blown up t to 35, it looks like crap. And you know, Lindsay Hogg is like, no, we can make it look good. Side note, I'd like to see the original Technicolor 35 millimeter dye transfer print because Technicolor was still doing 35 millimeter to see if the color is true because everything I've seen of Let It Be is dark and gringy especially in Twickenham here it's at least a bit more lively in Twickenham Studios so John is sort of the one trying to like ease Paul and say you know at least there'll be a climax of us getting our act together and performing the songs for the camera that we've been rehearsing wouldn't that be great? You know, we finally got, after everything, we now got our act together. John is so, 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 sort of trying to calm Paul down. You know, it's it's sort of, he, it was his number, but now it's all of our number. I think that's, that's what's hurting Paul. So then they come up with the idea to Paul about going on the roof. And Paul takes a tour up there to see if it could hold the equipment. And, uh, you know... It's it's not this you know sort of winter of discontent. It was like at Twickenham they're coming apart, but they are fighting to keep it together. And now it's like 
the four-headed monster again. Not just it was a general better vibe, the way it was talked about. No, this is the four-headed monster. Five-headed monster when you include Billy Preston. So, yes, I loved both episodes. I do get people saying they're long, but I'm happy they're long. Um, and I got to tell people who are are shelling or who are sharing the few n negative reviews that are out there, like the one in the Guardian. Um, the last I looked, it was still a fresh uh, rating on Rotten Tomatoes as far as the critics go. There's more critics that are for it than against it. Uh, the important critics are the ones who are really raving about it. Okay, Peter Traver, uh, I mean Rolling Stone. Uh, the you know critic on RogerEbert.com, the critic for Vanity Fair, uh, Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun Times, uh, uh, Mike uh, uh, LaSalle of the San Francisco Chronicle, I believe. So it's um, it's really good. I can't wait for part three. I can't wait to watch these all together. Uh, so much we've been told over the years, you know, like I said, has now been proven. To be a bunch of bollocks. It's not this hate filled thing. It's what I wanted this to be a well rounded picture. And even let it be when you think about it, it is not all um it's 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 not all glum. It's not all grim. Um I just think let it be is not focused as a film. This is focused. It's, it's really showing that, one, the Beatles bit off more than they can chew, which is probably another reason why Twickenham was so uh, bad, because John didn't have enough songs. Paul's coming up with all these songs, uh, but Paul wants John to contribute, and they only have this short amount of time to write and record a new album and perform it in front of a live audience. So Ringo th can then go and film the Magic Christian, but at Twickenham, uh, but at Apple, their backs against the wall. Even George says um, everything great that the Beatles did, uh, it, you know, just it happened when our uh, spontaneously, you know, uh, he says something to that effect, and um, I'm thrilled with this thing. Um, and I'll talk about part three tomorrow. This is rather long, so I apologize, but, uh, please leave me some comments. Please leave me some comments. I know people are going to have comments about this, and, um, I'm just... <sighs> Thank you, Peter Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say it one more time. Thank you. In your body of work, this is becoming um, just as epic and just as, as warranted as your Lord of the Rings trilogy. Hobbit trilogy is a bit flawed, but I still like the Hobbit trilogy. You know, uh, thank you for this, Peter. I'll talk to you guys soon.